Moriarty, and um, he's the uh, creator of a, a, a bunch of really um, important and influential games, um, uh, adventure games that he worked on at places like Infocom and LucasArts, uh, Wishbringer, Trinity, Loom, um, and um, he's also um, the um, he, he gave a bunch of really interesting and, and important and influential talks at GDC. I remember when the New York crew first started going to GDC way, way, way back in the day. Me and Eric, um, Tracy Fullerton, Karen Seidman, and folks like that, uh, uh, snot-nosed art punks, you know, <laughs> like who wanted to like revolutionize games. And we um, got to GDC, and the talks that Brian Moriarty gave were so powerful and moving um, and important to us. Uh, they were, how to describe them? It was almost like if you took a, if you took a diff, right? If you, if you looked at the differential between E3 and GDC, you, it would equal Brian Moriarty, right? It, and, and, the, and the talks that he was giving, right? Because they were strange and eccentric and elliptical and mysterious and performative, um, and they were about these um, challenging and complex topics as if games, as if it were just obvious that games were something like film or poetry uh, or music or dance uh, or any other cultural form that is capable of addressing the kind of deep mysteries of, of what it means to be human uh, in the world. And they were just beautiful, beautiful, strange, wonderful things. Um, more recently, uh, Brian gave a talk which was a kind of a direct engagement with uh, Rog Roger Ebert's uh, claims about the limits of, of games and what they can and can't do as kind of expressive culture. Um, but, I, but I really, looking back on it now, I think that every talk that Brian Moriarty ever gave at GDC was an engagement with, with Ebert <laughs> and, and those ideas because he was just demonstrating um, through his life, through his work, um, and his design work and, and, and through his thinking uh, and, and, and now through, through teaching uh, game design um, that, that games are capable of, of being a, a form of culture that is, that, is, that is like that, right? It is like these other things. It is deeply expressive and, and, and mysterious and, and elliptical and, and beautiful and, and weird. So um, it's an incredible honor to uh, welcome him here to practice. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Moriarty. Thank you. I don't know how I can live up to that today. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to be deep or elliptical. I'm just going to have a little fun. Okay? <laughs> Citizens, it is 4.15 p.m. <laughs> Now it's time for the payoff, as Gene and I each choose our personal selections for the worst film of the year. This is the segment that asks the question, can a film be worse than jury duty? And in my case, I'm picking not only the worst film of the year, but also the worst idea for a film. The name of my selection is Mr. Payback. And it was one of those interactive movies that were hyped real big last spring and then fell right off the edge of the map. The idea was simple. They rigged up a theater with individual computerized consoles with controls at every seat. Then they showed you this movie that had choices in it, and he got to choose the punishments for an assortment of villains. For example, here is a character who parks in a handicap zone. I say, screw the handicap! I'm parked there, and I ain't moving. No problem. You won't move it? I will. One piece at a time. The basic problem I had with the choices on the screen in Mr. Payback was that they didn't have one called None of the Above, which I would have voted for every time. <laughs> if there were buzzwords that did not turn on the audience during the year, they were virtual reality and interactivity. I think the jury is still out on virtual reality, but interactivity looks as dead as a doornail. That's my choice. The reason is very basic. We don't want to interact with the movie. We want it to act on us. That's why we go. 
so we can lose ourselves in the experience. Uh, if we're going to have to make the choices, we ought to be paid instead or, of the writer. Or you do what's out in the lobby of some uh, theaters, which is you play the video play game. The video Don't game. try and mix the two of them together. It's it. not going to work. 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 Welcome to practice 2015. I am, in fact, Professor Moriarty. More precisely, I'm a professor of practice in game design at Worcester Poly Tech. Part of my practice there is the study and teaching of history. Every other year, I offer a course which surveys the development of a broad range of entertainment technologies, including photography and phonography, motion pictures, radio, television, computers, and, of course, digital games and VR. One of my lectures covers the history of interactive fiction. To my undergraduates now, born in the late 1990s, the computers and people and companies I talk about probably seem pretty remote, ancient. But for me, Infocom and Lucasfilm Games are living memories, and I have met and worked beside many of the people whose names appear in the indices of my assigned readings. Recent discoveries have made it necessary for me to revise my curriculum. I thought this gathering of practitioners would be an appropriate place to share this revision. Much of the material you're about to watch is obscure, hard to find, and not shown very often. Indeed, some of it appears to have gone completely unnoticed for a very long time. When I informed Eric Zimmerman of what I would be showing at NYU this afternoon, he accused me of fabricating a hoax. I, was I am assuredly not that clever. This lecture incorporates historic video footage, some of it over half a century old. In a few scenes, women and men are sexually objectified, roughly treated, and physically assaulted. I've included this footage for its historic significance, if you find such material disturbing, you may wish to excuse yourself from this presentation. No offense is intended to anyone. The idea of an audience participating to some extent in the relation of a story is hardly new. Live tail spinners, actors, musicians, clowns have always engaged with their onlookers, inviting them to cheer on the heroes, weep over orphans, boo the villains, offer commentary, and add embellishment to the stories as they were being unfolded. Perhaps the most famous scripted example of this is found near the end of Jam Barry's 1904 drama, Peter Pan. Tink. Are you dying? Her light is growing faint. If it goes out, that means she's dead. Her voice is so low, I can scarcely hear what she's saying. She says she thinks she could get well again if children believed in fairies. Do you believe in fairies? Say quick that you believe. If you believe, clap your hands. Clap louder. Allowing an audience to play in the margins of an unfolding story is a wonderful way to encourage engagement but marginal participation is not agency. Barry's script assumes that the actor or actress playing Peter will persuade the audience to save Tinkerbell. His script doesn't provide any instruction for what should happen if nobody applauds. <laughs> like all traditional stories, Peter Pan is meaningful and satisfying because it plays out certainly. That's what a story is a particular causally related sequence of events. 
Story is distinct from narrative, though, which is how a story is presented. And by employing the narrative device of switching to a different story, we create the effect of interactivity, the illusion of agency. Stories with switches. Where does this idea come from? 1598, a folio of the, collection, folio of the collected works of Sir Philip Sidney concludes with a description of a royal mask commissioned by Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and performed at his Wadstead mansion around 1578. This untitled drama, which later came to be known, delightfully, as the Lady of May, involves a conflict between a shepherd and a woodsman who both want to marry the same girl. The suitors present their qualifications over several pages of passionate verse, but the outcome of the argument is not scripted. At the end, the lucky groom was selected by a distinguished member of the audience, the patroness of the mask, Her Majesty Elizabeth I. Three and a half centuries later, an unknown Hollywood playwright desperate for attention tried the same trick. Ayn Rand devised a courtroom drama in which a jury selected from members of the audience would decide the guilt or innocence of the defendant. Here are the two scripted endings, each comprising only a few sentences. Rand herself derided this device as a gimmick, but it worked. Her play, eventually known as The Night of January 16th, was produced in Hollywood in 1933 and enjoyed a moderately successful run on Broadway the following year, launching the career of one of the most influential and controversial writers of the 20th century. A few years later, the British philosopher and science fiction author Olaf Stapledon published his fourth novel, Star Maker. This modest book aspires to be nothing less than a history of the entire universe. It contains many original ideas, including the first articulation of the zoo hypothesis, as well as a first description of a Dyson sphere. This passage, though, is of particular interest. In one inconceivably complex cosmos, whenever a creature was faced with several possible courses of action, it took them all thereby creating many distinct temporal dimensions and distinct histories of the cosmos. Since in every evolutionary sequence of the cosmos there were very many creatures, and each was constantly faced with many possible courses, and the combinations of all their courses were innumerable, an infinity of distinct universes exfoliated from every moment of every temporal sequence in this cosmos. Yipe. Stapledon's book had many famous admirers, including Arthur C. Clarke, Werner Vinge, and particularly Jorge Luis Borges, who in 1941 published The Garden of Forking Paths, a short story which describes, but does not attempt to implement, a fictional novel in which every decision point creates two or more new storylines, exfoliating into a maze of branches, loops, and interactions. In 1951, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 imagined a futuristic TV soap opera in which viewers are invited to assume the role of a missing character, reading lines prepared for them in advance. This scene from the 1966 movie adaptation by Francois Truffaut delightfully brings Bradbury's concept to life. Will you come play with us? You will? Good. I thought you would. Come in, cousins. Be one of the family. See here, Charles, do you realize what a dilemma this is? It's terribly difficult. I don't see any way out of it at all. Oh, come, 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 Bernard. Of course there's a way out. We can put the two children in Helen's room, for instance. What do you think, Linda? Look, we're here. They're waiting for you. I think that... You see, Linda agrees with me. Lottie's children must go in with Helen's children, of course. Linda's absolutely right. But then there's the problem of the seating, Charles. I think I've got something worked out, though. We put Madeline at the head of the table. It's Madeline, isn't it, Linda? Absolutely. Well, if Linda thinks it's all right, well, then of course it must be. But there's still the problem about the rooms, Charles. Well, what rooms are left? There's the pink room. We could always put Lillian in the pink room. What can we do with Monica? Do you have the answer, Linda? <laughs> In the blue room? 
Linda, you're right. She's right. Linda, you're absolutely fantastic. Just love it. That scene is silly mainly because of its earnestness. But earnestness was never a problem for William Castle. In the four years between 1958 and 62, this second-rate director of kiddie horror movies single-handedly pioneered a number of important, immersive, and interactive techniques, always with his tongue in his cheek and his eye on your parents' wallet. Castle started small with Macabre, which offered viewers a $1,000 insurance policy against death by fright. He raised the stakes in 1959 with House on Haunted Hill, in this film, a life-size skeleton appeared to fly out of the movie screen and over the heads of the audience without any need for 3D glasses. <laughs> this startling effect, which he called Emerjo, was admittedly somewhat primitive. It involved an inflated plastic skeleton suspended on a system of ropes and pulleys. Most of the cinemas that installed Emerjo removed it after the first weekend. In those days, Many boys still carried slingshots. <laughs> Castle really hit his stride in 1960. The Tingler was the first movie to induce haptic sensations, an idea first imagined by Huxley in his 1931 novel Brave New World. Near the end of the story, the giant centipede that has been terrorizing the actors on screen finds its way into your theater. Electric buzzers hidden under a handful of seats delivered jolts of noise and vibration that reportedly sent viewers screaming for the exits. Later the same year, Castle made history again. Imagine a movie in which each person in the audience can decide which version of a scene will appear on the theater screen, individually and at the same time. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be interactive? When you see 13 ghosts, you'll be given a supernatural viewer like this, which will enable you to penetrate for the first time into the spirit world. By printing the ghosts in red against a blue background, the ghost viewer allowed each member of the audience to decide what they would see. Looking through the top filter made the ghosts appear in high contrast. Looking through the bottom blue filter made them completely disappear. A case can be made for calling 13 Ghosts the first interactive movie. But the self-proclaimed king of showmanship was just getting warm. <laughs> For years I have searched for a unique way whereby a motion picture audience can actually decide the climax of a picture. I have found such a way. My latest picture, Mr. Sodonicus, offers something no audience has ever had before. The power to determine the fate of a character on the screen. The power to punish. The deformed face of Baron Sardonicus is too shocking to display in a public lecture. <laughs> Here's how the punishment poll worked. When you bought a ticket to see Mr. Sardonicus, you were given a small card bearing a picture of a thumb printed with glow-in-the-dark ink. In the theater lobby was a cardboard kiosk called the Activator. It had a slot in front. If you held your card inside the slot, a light bulb behind the kiosk illuminated your card, energizing the phosphorescent thumb. I spent decades of my life trying to obtain an original punishment poll card. Finally, six years ago, an authentic specimen finally appeared on eBay. I paid 50 bucks for it. My maximum bid was 20 times that amount. <laughs> After the lecture, you may respectfully approach the podium to pay homage to this <laughs> historic artifact. 
Now, near the end of the story, the Baron's henchman learns how his master's disfigurement can be cured. Krull, whose left eye was put out by Sardonicus in a fit of rage, must now decide. Will he tell Sardonicus the secret that will save him, or keep it to himself? The action pauses, and Castle appears on screen. I think ordinary punishment is too good for Mr. Sardonicus. If you feel that way too, if you want to show him no mercy and punish him as he deserves, then hold up your punishment pole ballot with the thumb pointing down, like this. If, on the other hand, uh, you're one of those I wouldn't hurt a fly kind of people, one of those sweet, nice, kind souls uh, who would let Mr. Sardonicus go free, you should hold your ballad with the thumb pointing up, like this. And now we're ready for the voting. No mercy or mercy. <laughs> During this sequence, a luckless member of the theater staff was supposed to count the thumbs and tabulate the votes. This must have been difficult, as the phosphorescent glow induced by the activator lasted only a few minutes. The thumbs were dark long before the punishment poll ever got started. No mercy. So be it. You have given the verdict. You have made the decision, and the majority of you have sentenced Mr. Sardonicus to further punishment. Mr. Projectionist, let the sentence be carried out. The punishment poll was a fraud. Like Bradbury's TV soap opera, it offers the promise of different outcomes, but doesn't bother to implement more than one of them. I call this a sardonic option. <laughs> Five years passed before another attempt was made to present an interactive movie. It happened in Montreal at Expo 67, probably the last of the great world's fairs. Here in the pavilion of Czechoslovakia was a unique and very popular cinema showing six times a day what current histories identify as the first machine implementation of a branching narrative. Kino Automat was co-written and directed by Radu Sincera. I expect many of you have never heard of Sincera or his film before today. This is not surprising. Aside from contemporary summary accounts and a handful of photographs, Few details about the do uh, operation of Kino Automat are available, at least in English. After being shown at the World's Fairs of 67, 68, and 72, the movie disappeared for over 30 years. Thankfully, Sincera's daughter is now actively promoting her father and his pioneering work. A digital restoration of Kino Automat has recently been shown at a number of film festivals. Here, courtesy of Life magazine, is one of the few very good photographs we have of the original Kino Automat cinema. It was rather small, with only 124 seats. Each seat had a pair of push buttons in its armrest, one green, one red. Around the perimeter of the screen were 124 numbered squares that glowed red or green, depending on which button had been pushed. The movie was presented by two live actors, a man and a woman, who prompted the audience and sometimes pretended to interact with the characters on the screen. Where are we here? Technically, Kino Automat consisted of two 35mm film projectors locked in sync, each loaded with 50 minutes of film. Both projectors ran together for the entire show without stopping. Switching between the two images was performed manually using a mechanical shutter. Freeze frames were used to pause the action when it was time for the audience to vote. The live actors were completely scripted and tightly coordinated with the running film to ensure that voting was complete before the action continued. Now you have an idea of what Keto Automat was and how it worked. Let's take a detailed look at how they used it. This is now possible thanks to an interactive DVD released in 2009 in an extremely limited edition available only in Czechoslovakia. We spare no expense. Return with me now to 1967, the summer of love and Sgt. Pepper, to that little cinema on Ile Notre Dame, and rediscover the strange and revolutionary film to which all of us here owe so much, Radu Sincera's 
Kino on a mat. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like the film is broken. But can the film at the computer be broken? Most likely not. But once upon a time, every performance of Kino Automat, the very first interactive film in the world, started like this. And now you have, after so many years, an extraordinary chance to get the taste of prehistoric interactivity. You don't believe me? Well, let's try. But one request, please, don't push on the red button at this moment. Or, well, uh, I, I'm sure you won't do that, you're not crazy. But anyway, please don't push on the red button, or it will cause a fire. We have been urged not to select an outcome, even though it is the only one implemented. I call this an Achtung option. <laughs> This dreary apartment complex in Prague is the home of the protagonist. We first meet his neighbors, a bachelor army captain with a poodle named Caesar, a pretty female student, her handsome boyfriend who always seems to be visiting, a married businessman who lives next door, his wife, who the protagonist assures us is very charming, twice, and a retired school teacher. The last to leave the building is the porter who guards the entrance. Finally, the protagonist himself, Mr. Novak. I'm to blame for all this. I'm to blame for all this. Wait, are you sure about that? We will go through the whole thing with you and try to find your mistake. We are going to stop the story several times and we will decide the situation for you. And now, Mr. Novak, tell us how it all happened. But let's go back to this morning. It was my wife's birthday. I couldn't decide what to give her, a fur coat or a ring. These are quite nice. Or oh, would you like something more special? I bought roses. I'll take those. A bait and switch option, implying a number of potential outcomes, none of which are implemented. How much? 40 crowns, please. Here, thank you. Thank you. And this is our block. I was entering the building in the best of spirits. Caesar! No self-discipline, have you? <laughs> they must be out. You should try ringing the bell, Mr. Novak. Oh, no! No, Captain, no, it's just, uh, I got mixed up with the doors. You see, I'm trying to get into my I flat. I understand perfectly, Mr. You Novak. Have. I've often found that I've stopped the lift on the wrong floor. <laughs> oh, no! Please, will you help me, Mr. Novak? Can I come in for a minute? Why? I haven't any clothes on. The wind blew my door shut and I can't get back in. How awkward for you, it but you must it. understand my position. I, I'm afraid I can't I, help you. My wife will be home in a minute. It's her birthday, and I... Don't worry, I haven't seen a thing. Don't worry. Oh, my God, that's Please, awkward. please, don't worry. I'll explain everything to your wife. You can't leave me standing out here in the nude. Please, try to understand. Stop. You see, maybe the whole thing started right here. Maybe this was his first mistake. This lady is a stranger, and this lady has no clothes on. Mr. Novak had the choice of two possibilities. To refuse. It's impossible. Or to let her in. Impossible. Oh, please, please. You better come in. So, you have to decide. The green button says, do not let her in. The red one, let her in. Again, 
The green button says, do not let her in. The red one, let her in. You've got 10 seconds. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Afternoon. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> please. <clears throat> oh. Oh, my God! <gasps> it's Mrs. Svoboda. <laughs> hmm. So I see. Now, please, don't jump to conclusions. It isn't at all what you imagine. Mrs. Svoboda! Mrs. Svoboda! Would you be so kind as to... Have you seen my wife by any chance? Martha! Martha! <laughs> Darling! I was doing the ironing and suddenly there was a ring at the door. Mr. Novak was kind enough to let me come in because I had no clothes on. I wasn't expected home until six. Mr. Spoboda, be reasonable. I've never have found out what was going Please, on here. You must Mr. Spoboda. Be... Well, what is it? I was. Well. It's all right. Thank you. Mr. Spoboda, I'm surprised at you, Mr. Novak. You don't look Arthur, like a... Just a minute. I'm cold. Tell Arthur, you're cold. I've been Martha, trying to tell you everything. Quite clear. You're not coming back here again. Don't listen to me. Martha, where are you going? Let me in. Come you back, can't leave Martha. Me out here in the new. Please, let me in. This is Take your hands off me. Martha. We'll be sorry when they find me. No, wait. <clears throat> Martha. Mrs. Normally, the form film would continue running at this point. <laughs> However, I'm stopping it here so we can do something 1967 audiences could not do. Go back and see what would have happened if Mr. Novak had decided not to let his neighbor into the apartment. Going to play, play. The green button says, do not let her in. The red one, let her in. You've got 10 seconds. The door banged shut. I, I didn't explain the whole thing to you. I see. You weren't expecting me so early. No. Please don't. Let me tell you what happened. Hello, Martha. You're being silly. Look, Mr. Novak, I'm not blind. I can see what's going on here. But you're quite wrong, Mrs. Svoboda. Please, he's got nothing to do That's with right. it. It's obvious who's to blame. What do you mean by that? For heaven's sake, try to be reasonable, Mr. Svoboda. The situation is perfectly obvious. What happened? What is it? Mm. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you. But you needn't explain. I've known my wife for five years. Why won't you let me tell you what happened? I was ironing and somebody rang the doorbell. Goodbye, I'm going out. Give me oh. the keys. You can't leave me here in the nude. I... I... Martha, I... Yes, Mrs. Novak, I was outside. I didn't have any clothes on and your husband came out and Don't offered to help that. me. Don't say that. Excuse me, Mrs. Novak. I'm sorry to you. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to tell you. And when I came home, what do I find? That's enough from you. Take me for a fool. I saw her going into your flat. All I've of you. more than enough. I'll explain it. He... Don't bother. Martha. Martha. Martha, come back. Wait now, Martha. I... Let me make it quite clear you're not coming back in here again. You Mr. can't Martha. let me in. Let me in. Mrs. Fobita, please. Get your hands off me. Martha. You'll be sorry when they find me. No, wait, no. Martha. Mrs. Oh.
What you've just seen is the first known example of one of the most important techniques in branching narrative. <laughs> the foldback, which seems to offer a number of unique outcomes, but eventually converges to a single outcome. This strategy to avoid exfoliation of content has been employed by nearly every branching narrative produced in the last half century. Please help him. He now has a strange lady in his own flat and his own wife in a strange flat. Decide for him, according to your own inclination. Where should he go? The green button says to follow his wife. The red one to help Mrs. Swoboda. The green button to follow his wife. The red one to help Mrs. Swoboda. Are you all right? <clears throat> Mr. Novak tries to get into his neighbor's apartment from the outside, but ends up back inside his own apartment instead. If you don't open the door, I'll call the police! Don't I'll you ever get me into a mess like that again? I thought hey, you were- What's going on up there? Let it's me. nothing to do with you! Oh, how can you do this to me? <sighs> Mrs. Fulbert, please, will you calm down? Stop! Excuse me. I know you made your choice and we complied. But, mm, what a marvelous word, but. How often in life does one say but? Now we give you the opportunity to use this but. So let's return to the previous choice. Go back, Mr. Novak. Another history-making moment. I allow our audiences to go back to replay since Sarah invented the checkpoint oh, okay. save. Let's think it over once more. For the last time, <laughs> you now have an opportunity to do something that in real life wouldn't be possible. Actually, to decide something that has been already decided. That's a pause where I should have said that last. The green button says to follow his wife, the red button to help Mrs. Svoboda. Green button to follow his wife, the red one to help Mrs. Svoboda. Mr. Novak and the captain chase Mrs. Novak's taxi through the streets of Prague, leading to a risky encounter with the police. <laughs> Make your choice. The green button says to drive off. The red one to stop. The green button to drive off. The red one to stop. The chase continues with the police in pursuit. Desperate to clear his name, Novak tries to prove his innocence to his neighbor. Sorry to disturb you, but could I see your boyfriend for a minute? Uh, the one who came in this afternoon? There's no one here. Has he gone? No one's been. Someone's been here, and I know he has. A tall, good-looking boy. I took him up in the lift. No one. Just a minute. I'm afraid you don't understand me. I must see your boyfriend. The green button says to go into the flat. Take your hands off me. Inside. The red button says to apologize and leave. I'm sorry, I must have been mistaken. Yes, you were. You got three seconds only. Why so little? The lady is getting cold. An option with a short fuse. Nowadays, we call this sort of thing a quick time event. <laughs> let me in, let me in! You dirty old man! The iron in the neighbor's apartment locked is, uh, apartment is... Don't touch man. it! You're not allowed in here! You should call the fire brigade! Don't touch the insulation! And don't tell me what to do! I'm trying to tell you we're on fire! You're trying to tell me, but I'm telling you! <laughs> Don't do that! Didn't you read the sign? Hey! It is forbidden by tenants not to be extremely dangerous! Now get out! Make your selection. The green button says to hit. The red one, not to hit. The green one, to hit. The red one, not to hit. <laughs> Hmm. 
Novak leaves to retrieve his wife from his mother-in-law. By the time he returns, his apartment complex is in flames. I'm to blame for all this. <laughs> you see, Mr. Novak still thinks he is to blame for all this. But you have been through this whole story with him, so you too must come to a final conclusion. It only remains to process the data and arrive at a verdict. Guilty or not guilty? Red or green? Red, guilty. Green, not guilty. It's you who must decide, please. A sardonic option. From this point until the end of the movie, the footage in Keto Automat's two projectors was identical. Only the script of the live actress changes in response to the voting. <laughs> Somebody's locked the door. I have. I beg your pardon? Who? I, the Kino Automat. But why? Because you're not guilty. <laughs> Don't say that. I know, we know best what started the catastrophe. It was because Mr. Novak mistook the door to his own flat. Do you think so? With your permission, I will feed back to you the sequence of events if you had not stopped at the wrong door. The Kino Automat has achieved sentience. It has taken over the show, proving Mr. Novak's innocence by demonstrating to the audience that the fire in the apartment building would have happened anyway. Your choices didn't matter. The ironic aesthetic of branching narrative is established. Who was that gentleman? This one? I'm sorry, this one? Yes. Mrs. Svoboda's lover? But someone had to set the house on fire. Correct. That means someone is guilty. Don't use such emotional language. An intricate, highly complex structure like that, inhabited by sophisticated and highly complex individuals, has got to burn down one day. And here we are again. Two possibilities, two endings. One, a happy one, bright and gay. The other, a sad one, black and horror. Make your last choice, ladies and gentlemen. A happy one, green. Horror, red. My congratulations. From the 32 different stories that could be told, you have picked today the nicest combination. My compliments. Well, I don't say this because I'm speaking to you. I say this every time. And now, the end according to your wishes. Mr. Novak doesn't exist. Mr. Novak, that's you and me too. We are all Mr. Novak and we're all guilty. Yoo-hoo! Mr. Novak, stop making such a fuss. I set the place on fire. Yes, you had nothing to do with it. Perhaps I should have told you that she's very fond of sliding down the chute. You should take up a hobby like me and relax. Well, I'm ready. Come on, boys. This is a flow diagram for Kino Automat. It starts with an octung, followed by a bait and switch. Then there are four fold backs, the second with a replay loop, the fourth with a QTE, concluding with a pair of sardonic options. Mr. Sardonicus and Keto Automat established many of the techniques commonly associated with modern branching narratives. This is where it all comes from, perhaps. But movies weren't the only medium experimenting with interactivity in the 1960s. Postmodernist theater and fiction by authors like Lessing, Nabokov, and Saporta were actively exploring multilinear and generated texts. Julio Cortazar's Rayula, or Hopscotch, invited readers to explore its chapters in any order they liked. 
Raymond Quinault, founder of Alipo, a workshop for potential literature, published on Conte de Votre Façon, a story your way, in 1967, contemporaneous with Kino Automat. This work instructed readers to turn to specific pages in the book, depending on what they wanted to happen. Edward Packard popularized this technique in his 1976 publication, Sugar Cane Island, the first of what came to be known as Choose Your Own Adventure Books. Until quite recently, 1976 was also widely believed to be the year in which computers were first used to implement interactive fiction. That is the year Willie Crowther turned his experience of real-life cave exploration into a text simulation on a PDP-10 mainframe. Don Woods later expanded Crowther's work into an epic fantasy, which was subsequently condensed by Scott Adams into the first commercial adventure game, published for the TRS-80 in 1978. Now, no one can deny the historical importance and immense influence of Colossal Cave and Adventureland. I had the pleasure of joining Don Woods on a panel at PAX East a few years ago and publicly thanked him for making our careers possible. Nevertheless, over the decades, there have been persistent rumors of a text adventure created before Crowther and Woods. Graham Nelson dropped a tantalizing reference to it in his informed designer's manual, and last April, the rumor was substantiated. Peter Langston is already renowned as the author of Empire, the first digital 4X strategy game and precursor to civilization in 1971. He was the founder of my former employer, Lucasfilm Games, in 1984. Thanks to the detective work of bloggers Anthony Hope and Jason Dyer, we now have proof that Langston was also the creator of Wander, a development system for interactive text adventures. Several games made with Wander have been recovered, and with luck we may soon get our hands on the source code of the 1974 original. Crowther and Woods had a precursor. But do interactive computer stories really start with Peter Langston? And what about Scott Adams? Was he really the first to market an interactive narrative? Those of you familiar with war board games will probably recognize this name. George Phillies is one of the world's leading authorities on the topic. He's written several books, including two volumes entirely devoted to a single game, Stalingrad. Over the decades, George has amassed the largest collection of board war games in the world, together with the most complete collection of related literature and periodicals. Until this summer, when he retired, George was a colleague of mine at Worcester Polytech. He was a physics professor there, and also taught a course on tabletop gaming in my department. A few weeks before he retired, George invited me to a tour of the secure facility where his collections are stored. <laughs> it was an impressive sight. Not maybe that impressive, but still pretty impressive. Row after row of metal shells stacked to the brim with thousands of war games from all over the world. File cabinets stuffed with magazines. The labor of love of a lifetime. As we prepared to leave, I suddenly noticed a familiar but quite unexpected title high on a shelf filled with miscellaneous artifacts. I turned to George in surprise. You have a brainiac. I said. Got it for my 11th birthday, he told me. Very carefully, I lowered the near mythical cardboard box from the shelf and opened the lid. Impossible. A complete, untouched specimen. Literally trembling with excitement, I picked up the pristine owner's manual and quite randomly turned it to page 49. Brainiac was a rebranding of an electrical hobby kit, first marketed under the name Geniac in December of 1955. Geniac was an acronym for, get ready for it, Genius Automatic Computer. It was the brainchild of these two men, 
Edmund Berkeley, and Oliver Garfield. If you think the Altair 8080 or Apple I were the first personal computers, think again. Edmund Berkeley was selling plans for Simon, a two-bit computer with 125 realized and a paper tape reader back in 1950. It cost 600 bucks and a pretty good machine shop to build this monster. That's the equivalent of about $5,900 today, not what you would call an, in an impulse purchase. Geniac, on the other hand, was targeted at high school kids and priced at $19.95, still nearly $200 today, but within the means of well-heeled parents. Here are the original parts and manual for the first consumer device marketed as a computer or electric brain. The manual is credited to and copyrighted by Oliver Garfield, who was probably Geniac's lead designer. In essence, Geniac is an electric state machine programmed by hardwiring. The base components are a perforated masonite board and six large dials with matching holes. By attaching conductive bolts and jumpers to these components, you can construct custom rotary switches each switch supports up to 16 positions, with one or two poles per position. Incandescent light bulbs, powered by a pair of D batteries, are used to indicate the state of the circuit. Logic is implemented by wiring the switch poles together. The jumpers on the dials are aligned to match the poles on the project board. A power switch between the batteries activates the circuit. Different bulbs are illuminated as each dial is turned depending on the logic instantiated by the circuit design. You can see that kind of sort of working there. Now, the 1955 Geniac manual provided plans for 33 logic circuits. These ranged from simple binary adders, multipliers, and comparators to odd gadgets such as this intelligence tester and a combination lock. Interestingly, it also included two games, Project 26, a version of the classic takeaway puzzle, NIM, and Project 27, a machine to play tic-tac-toe, though they seem to have had some trouble spelling this consistently. <laughs> as far as I can determine, these are the first computer games ever offered to consumers, predating the previous record holder, ESR's Dr. NIM, by almost a decade. Some of the circuits in Geniac feel a bit contrived. Project 10, the machine for the two jealous wives, is an alarm system designed to alert either wife if one of their husbands goes boating with the wrong wife without a chaperone, <laughs> or alone with the apparently attractive chaperone. Then there's Project 14, the masculine-feminine testing machine. Yeah, the purpose of this machine... <laughs> I swear this is not a hoax. <laughs> the, the purpose of this machine is, quote, to determine whether the person who answers five questions, if he or she answers them truthfully, is more masculine or more feminine. I have created a video simulation of this remarkable circuit, <laughs> so you can see it in action. Each of the five questions is assigned to a dial, starting in the top right corner. The default state of all questions is feminine. When power is applied to the circuit, the bulb on the left side lights up to indicate that the person being tested is so far more feminine. Let me take you through the questions one at a time. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Question one, whom do you prefer? Marilyn Monroe or Liberace? Question two, how would you thread a needle into a small hole? A, by wetting it, or B, by tapping it? <laughs> There's B. Yeah, really. Um, let's move on to question three, which would you agree with? A, women are better drivers than men because they are more careful, or B, men are better drivers than women because they get more practice and are more skilled? Question four, would you rather spend a day, A, shopping on Fifth Avenue, or B, hunting in the woods? 
And finally, question five, which makes a better toy for a child? A, a doll with a complete wardrobe, or B, an electric train set? The algorithm behind this miracle of behavioral analytics <laughs> is fairly basic. Any combination of three or more dials directed towards one gender assigns dominance to that gender. It's interesting to note that the physical assertiveness of the operator is directly related to the gender assignment. The more dials you push, the more male you become. <laughs> Let's return now to that moment in the storage facility when, trembling with astonishment, I opened the manual of George Philly's Brainiac Manual, quite randomly, to page 49. What I saw there was a description of a circuit which appears in the original GENIAC manual as Project 23, the uranium shipment and the space pirates. Problem, a uranium shipment from one of Jupiter's moons, Callisto, to Earth consists of a freighter ship loaded with uranium and a fighter ship disguised as a freighter. Space pirates are known to be lurking on one of the asteroids, Pallas or Hermes. The pirates suspect that one of the rocket ships is a disguised freighter. Therefore, they may either attack the first ship or wait in hiding for the second. The commander of the shipment can send either ship by the Pallas or the Hermes route and can send the fighter either first or second. If the pirate attacks the fighter, the pirate will be destroyed. If the pirate attacks the uranium ship and the fighter has already passed or taken the other route, the pirate captures the uranium. If the pirate attacks the uranium ship and the fighter is taking the same route and is behind the uranium ship, the pirate is destroyed, but during the battle, the pirate destroys the uranium ship. If the pirates do not attack, there is no combat. A story with switches. I asked George for permission to construct this circuit using his kit of original parts. He graciously consented with the understanding that after documenting the assembled project in photographs and video, I would disassemble it and, to the extent possible, restore his Brainiac to its original condition. To preserve the kit's original wiring, I obtained a new spool of the same gauge and color. That's about 30 feet of it under there. The long dead batteries were replaced with modern alkalines. All other parts are original. Geniac. Project 23, the uranium shipment, and the space pirates. The story is controlled by five two-position switches. This affords 32 unique input scenarios, each of which is mapped to one of four outcomes represented by the row of light bulbs. This simulation shows the circuit cycling through all of the possible states and outcomes. This clunky antique toy exposes the interactive story for what it really is, a Stapleton cosmos in which all possible outcomes are objectively real and exist simultaneously. Two years after GENIAC was released, physicist Hugh Everett proposed this as a model of quantum reality in his theory of the universal wave function. Stapledon imagined it, Borges and Bradbury described it, but in 1955, more than a decade before Kino Automat, and almost 20 years before Langston Crowther, Woods, and Adams, Edmund Berkey and Oliver Garfield were the first to realize and sell a computerized interactive story. A story electric. Truly, a potential literature. Thank you. Maybe time for one, one question. Yeah, one, one or two questions. Anybody? Thank you so much. That was great. Amazing. Red button, green button, anyone? Anyone want to check? Punish! 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 Guilty!
Uh, how about one one question? There, yeah, yes, please. I just have a comment that uh, the man versus woman test is actually relevant to this because it's a um, limitation game. Like the Al- Alan Turing test is, it started out with uh, you know a man and a woman being in a room and a third person and trying to figure out you know, who the man was. So that that is it is relevant. It's interesting, uh, but Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is amazing. I'm gonna, just one quick thought that I had while watching this sure. um, was how often um, ethics, morality, punishment, catching people uh, and punishing people um, is, is sort of like uh, intrinsically embedded in our notion. When we think about uh, choice and decision making in this explicit way, um, it's often about that. And it makes me think of you know, the evolution of our cognitive machinery and how much it has embedded in 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 its uh, in its in the very you know in our, the machinery of our brain. This idea, of so much of our cognitive machinery, seems to be about catching the, of like telling lies, sneaking around, catching each other, uh, breaking uh, promises, and uh, punishing people. You know what I mean? Isn't that isn't that strange? Have you have you have you thought of that at all? This kind of like what's 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 up with the kind of with that aspect? Do you do you think? Liberace? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, all right. thank you very much.